uh, if you're like me who likes to follow the agenda step by step and know, you know, what's the next, next talk and who's the person who's going to be talking, you know, you are in for a surprise, right? I'm a substitute for Barry, who's our CTO. And uh, I'm going to talk about scaling your startup and making the right decisions at the right time on behalf of him. And obviously, you know, I'm not Barry, I'm not CDO. I'm Aparva Joshi, I go by AJ. I uh, run products uh, for DO. A uh, little bit about myself, I'm uh, relatively new to DO. Uh, it's been about six or seven months. And it's been a fantastic journey, right? And uh, the goal of this uh, talk is to share some of my experiences from my past life uh, on uh, scaling uh, technologies, scaling people, and uh, scaling businesses. And the idea behind that is to share some of my learnings and failures so that you guys don't stumble and, you know, probably hopefully have a few takeaways uh, uh, from that. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about my past life. You know, it is uh, one single company that I've worked for for the last 17 years, and it's Microsoft. You know, I've uh, uh, had a pleasure or not so pleasure of working on the dark side of the company. <laughs> Uh, as well as working on the not-so-dark side of the company, which is uh, the incubation arm, right? So before joining Dio, I spent about eight to nine years uh, working on uh, incubation arm for Azure, and uh, that's where I learned uh, or made a lot of mistakes <laughs> that I want to share with you guys on how to scale technologies and people uh, and build te teams and, and focus on uh, building a culture and, and some of the things that you would hopefully uh, take away from this uh, presentation and help you uh, when you grow your business. All right, uh, like I said, three key factors we'll be talking about, you know, and, and, and at the three level we'll talk about going through a technology journey on how you uh, avoid some pitfalls and uh, what kind of decisions that you make. Uh, we'll talk about people and culture uh, and uh, the importance of that and investing in it in, it in the really early phase uh, to grow the org. And obviously, you know, building the effective engineering processes. You know, process is a bad word, but, you know, it's not so bad. And I'll tell you why in a little bit, why it is critical uh, to get it right from a get-go. All right, so this is a slide that I uh, stole from our user experience team that is an absolutely amazing team. You know, all the simplicity that you guys like about Dio, these are the guys who make it happen, right? And they, they have a very clear vision in their mind, right? And they, every project they start, they start with jobs to be done, right? And they essentially ask a question, and it applies to every startup, right? You know, what is the situation? What is the scenario that you're trying to solve for, right? It is very important that you get that right from day one. And what is the motivation? Not just for you, but for your end customers, right? What are they actually expecting as the outcome from your product, right? You're not, you're not just building uh, the product to have a specific outcome for yourself because if you're doing it that way, you're probably doing it wrong, right? What is your customer ex expecting out of the product, right? And keeping those things in mind and every single time that you iterate and asking the question, what is the job to be done, will help you stay honest. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so again, to, to summarize that in a way, like, you know, what are some of the qu questions in the, in the early stage that you have to ask yourself? Like, you know, do I have a cl clear problem statement? The elevator pitch, right? If you're with the VC or an investor in, in an elevator and you've got two minutes to talk about the problem that you're trying to solve, right? You absolutely have to nail that down, right? So if you are not convinced yourself, what is the problem that you're trying to solve and are confused, you probably should take some time to figure out what you're trying to build. You know, again, and, and, you know, and the, the other question that you want to ask uh, yourself is, uh, am I solving a problem that, you know, people really want it to be solved? In another way, you know, there are lots of problems that you feel passionate about and you think that are really important to solve, but most of people won't care about it, right? And uh, is that something, is that the path that you want to go for, right? Uh, some of the things that you can ask yourself, like, you know, if once I build the product, the problem that I'm solving, is there a market for there? Is customers willing to pay for the product, right? How, how am I going to monetize that? If the product is going to be free, where's the revenue going to come from, right? Am I going to sell more ads and collect the revenue later on and whatnot? But having a clear strategy on how you're going to monetize, it is a super key ingredient on building a product, right? You, you cannot say, I'm going to figure out later on, let me just try and get lots and lots of users and how I'm going to monetize this, that's a later story. Most of the startups fail in, in the later part of that, right? 
Again, knowing who you're targeting and what their motives are. Super important, right? Know your customers. You know, you might be building a things uh, for another startups or consumers, right? And at the same time in that uh, product building exercises, you will run into certain customers. They're not really typical fit for your product that you're trying to build. Learn how to say no, right? And do not get involved in a, maybe let me try and solve this problem for this one customer that's talking to me about, and maybe that's an enterprise customer, and probably give me a big deal or whatnot. It will deviate you away from what you're trying to build, right? So knowing who your customer is, is super critical, right? And, and for example, the needs of a higher end enterprise customers are very different, right? They're not feature oriented. They will come and ask you about security, right? You know, what is the compliance, right? And those are not the problems that you probably want to solve if your end user is not enterprise, right? So knowing that and your target in a different phases uh, of a product uh, management or product building is, is super critical, right? And this is my favorite one, right? Be, be aware of premature, uh, premature uh, optimization, right? Every product building exercise has different phases that you go through. And you know, most of you, and some of you, I know, how many of you are engineers in this room? Awesome, right? One of the biggest things that we take a lot of pride in is writing beautiful code, right? It needs to be perfect, right? It needs to be working all the time. You know, why is it this way? I don't like it. Let me spend some more time. You know, maybe you need to be careful about that. Sometimes taking the yankiest way possible to build the product out and getting it out of the market is the right strategy. But at the same time, being mindful on what you're doing and why you're doing and keeping that in the back of your mind is super important because at some point, it will come back to you. And you will be finding yourself in a situation where you have to make a decision that all that tech debt that I piled on, is it the right time for me to go fix it? And you have to accommodate it for that, right? And having that situation aligning with the growth state is probably not a good situation to be in, right? And I'll give you some examples of that uh, and walk you through that uh, on how some of those challenges were solved and, and, and some tips around that. Okay, so again, going back to that, making the right technology uh, decisions, right? Open source is a fantastic thing that has happened to the technology world, hands down, right? And I, I like to say this to a lot of people, and I use this quite a bit in Microsoft, be, the company not being that friendly to open source in the first uh, half of my career in a way, right? It's, it really doesn't matter how good of a software that you write, at the end of the day, OSS wins, right? So if you make the right bets, you know, and, and when you have a community contributing to a bunch of uh, innovations that are shared across lots of people around the world, they will come and beat you hands down. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the learnings that I had at Microsoft on why that was so critical and why that still remains to be biggest uh, thing to be done, right? So it's great for the speed, right? You know, it's easy to get open source for somewhere, prototype the product, get it out to the market, great. But you have to also understand, just because somebody wrote a code, it's not perfect, and open source is not free. And what I mean by that, not being free, is when you take the open source project, you know, there will be a, a scenarios where you end up customizing a few things here and there to meet your product's uh, requirement, right? <laughs> And those are the times when if things don't go right, if uh, the software fails and it's not the one that you wrote, trying to fix that and the amount of energy that goes is tremendous, right? You cannot be sitting out there and sending a question on a stack overflow and waiting for some 16 years old to come back <laughs> from college and reply to you like, you know, this is how you can fix it, right? It's hard, it's hard. So you have to be very careful on how much dependency that you're taking because once you do that, your customers are dependent on that, right? They don't care you using OSS. They care that you're using your product and you have to fix it as soon as possible. So that's what I meant by it's not being free. But it's the fastest way to prototype anything without reinventing the wheel and, and trying to get it right. Cloud-based uh, solutions uh, help you move fast. Like, you know, it's no surprise to anybody, you know, today in, in, in a cloud world, you know, everything that you want, you know, starting with DO, spinning up a droplet or a VM, it's so super easy, right? Uh, Fastest way to pro prototype, get stuff done, that's great. But the biggest uh, worry there is to watch it, watch it for a vendor lock-in, right? When you start using cloud, uh, one thing leads to another, and another thing leads to another, right? You start using more products, and you start building those uh, dependencies and Lego blocks around building your product, uh, and as soon you realize that you're locked in. Now, you need to scale up or probably go somewhere else. You're not happy with the cloud provider, right? Uh, what are you going to do? 
that is the hardest part. You know, that's not a situation you want to be in either, right? The other part about the cloud, uh, cloud betting on a cloud uh, in the early stages, also cost management. It's pretty easy and simple to forget it, right? When you're building a prototype and MVP, your cost gonna look very simple. The pricing right now in most of the cloud providers, and thankfully not with Dio, <laughs> they're very complicated. They're very complicated, right? Starting with bandwidth, you know, you have to run certain formulas and whatnot to figure out what, what is it gonna cost you. And the hardest way to find out what it's gonna cost you is, is when you're scaling, right? When you start your business doing great, and at the same time, your build starts getting bigger and bigger. And that's when you go like, what just happened, right? So, you know, and, and, and that's pretty true. And you know, if you look around the startup ecosystem, there are so many startups that are just out there trying to help you figure out what your build's gonna look like with AWS, what your build's gonna look like with Azure, right? And so that tells you it's complex, right? There is no simple answer to that. So keeping that, those things in mind as well uh, is critical. Uh, investing in a, de a development infrastructure, right? This never becomes a priority, but there's always in any startup, whether it's solo or two people or 10 people or whatnot, there is always this one person who does the thankless job of actually getting the stuff done right, like setting up the CI CD, right? You know, uh, source control and doing all that work that nobody really cares about, but it's actually very essential to do your job. Like I see a couple of people smile, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, you know, you can relate to that. And that, in my opinion, is a very critical resource, right? So when you're building a startup and when you find a person in your team that is doing the heavy lifting for everybody else to succeed, invest in that person, right? Treat them well. Being thankful for those uh, work that has been happening because nobody else wants to do that and without that it's pretty hard. Second, get your logging and observability right, right? Because right now in, a, in a today's world, uh, it's pretty easy to do a lot of things with microservices. So simple, and I want this piece of code, let me just go and turn this serverless out, right? Let me just spin this thing out. Microservices are amazing on solving a bunch of problems, but when things go wrong, debugging them is a nightmare, right? <laughs> like, okay, well, which piece is going where? What happened here, right? And which data is going to that point? So if you don't get the, get the uh, logging, tracing, alerting right, and you build an environment on top of microservices, it's gonna be chaos, right, at some point. And it's all hands on deck and you're gonna figure out, you know, spend most of your time trying to figure out what did I miss. So get that right, day one. And again, you know, build high leverage common components, right? It probably would not be an issue when you're a solo founder, two people team, three people team. When you get to 10, when people are working on multiple projects and features, they usually forget to talk to each other. And you know what I mean by that? You know, you'll find out the person 10 is writing and creating the same database that person two did. Right? And person 15 is gonna do the same thing, right? And, and, and soon you'll find out, you know, why are we doing the exact same thing that we could have leveraged to build a better product? So keep, keep an eye on that, right? And, and give, giving you an example of this, uh, one company that does this amazingly well, right? And I'll be honest about that, it's AWS, right? Whether they planned it around it or it happened by accident, it doesn't matter. But what they do around, uh, uh, these common components is, you know, they, they, their business started with Amazon.com, right? So they had to build these uh, microservices that did smaller things like, you know, a leader election, uh, state management, and things along the, uh, those lines to support the bigger uh, uh, website and the e-commerce business. But what they made it sure that we do not repeat when we build AWS services to somebody else go and bake the leader management into their own service or state management into their own service, right? They force every single service that come in Go talk to this transportation service team, right? Which is running three million bare metal <laughs> servers to support all of them, but do not rewrite the component, right? So that's one of the key learnings that you can take away as well, right? So if a company as big of that size can do it right, you know, it's a great opportunity for all of us uh, to learn from that. All right, so growing a team, right? You know, I, this is a slide that I put uh, on a fly because this is a topic pretty uh, close to my heart, right? Uh, some of the key things that, that the biggest learning that I had was when, when you grow in a team, you should be in an ABR mode, right? Which is always be recruiting. The obvious question comes in, well, what do you mean by always be recruiting? I, I don't have headcounts. I don't have a position for this. Well, none of that matters, right? And here's why. Finding resources or a human capital in today's world is super, super difficult. So if somebody's coming to you, and saying, you know, hey, talk to this person. Super amazing guy, a girl that does this great job or whatnot. You might not have an opening today, you might have in future, right? Build those connections. Take time to talk to them. 
have those relations, right? And what you will end up finding is probably, you know, you have an employee in your team that is good at doing X, Y, Z, but there's a new skill set that you never thought about. Maybe I can put this generalist that I have onto a different task and give this job to so-and-so person. So do not let these excuses that are, I don't have the funding, I don't have the job opening, that's not a right fit to stop you from talking to people, right? Build bridges, always be recruiting, have that mindset. It is very difficult to find the right people when you need them. Your early employees will shape the future of the company, right? That's no brainer. As a founder, you shape the future of the company. The next person that you hire, he or she will have an influence on what the future of the company is gonna go look like. At high level, do not try and optimize for hiring for a specific skill set. Go for generalists, right? A person who can wear multiple hats, right? And do any job that you need to at any given point. Can write a code, can kind of talk to customers, can do marketing. It doesn't have to be perfect at every single thing, right? But try and invest in, in a generalist, right? Hire for attitude and not the aptitude. EQ or skills, right? And it goes back to the same, same thing, right? If you get a person with the right mindset and right attitude, can do it, I will learn it. Skills can be learned, but a wrong ad attitude will destroy the business, right? So if, if you have a person who has a great attitude, might not have the skills that you need today, make a bet on that person, right? People learn, and they will help you grow. And there will be times in, in the journey where actually you need those kind of people who help you with the right attitude and lift the whole all boats up, right? Build a diverse team, right? And this is super critical. Do not make that as an afterthought. Do not be in a situation where you have to go and solve uh, for that situation, which is having a diverse team gives you a very different perspective about the product that you're trying to build, right? Uh, the arguments that you're gonna have, the insight that you're gonna have uh, from your customers and, and a thought process that you will have, it is so fantastic to get this right from day one. Right? And you will reap the benefits of investing in it from day one in a long, long run. When possible, promote from within, especially when you're building a startup, right? Uh, as your team is growing, as you're trying to get more and more people out, right, people need to feel committed, right? In a startup, they're working really hard, probably not getting paid as much as they would get somewhere else or whatnot. Everybody has an aspiration, inspiration, right? They wanna do well with their career and grow within. So if you have somebody within the company that is doing great, try and promote within. If you don't, and you absolutely have to get it somebody from outside, and I will talk about that in a why and what situations that you have to, go for it. And this, is, this shouldn't be any surprise to anybody, right? When you go for hiring, your biggest hiring success rate and the right people will actually come through employee referrals, right? It helps build that connections. The, there are stats that shows that in, in the hiring percentage of uh, people going through a loop and actually getting the job through employee referral are much, much higher. Then the second one is the proactive approaches, right? You, you can hire an HR agency who goes out and you know, scouts the candidate for you, reach out to them proactively, and, and your success rate is higher. As you grow, as your company becomes very popular, you're gonna get tons of inbound applications. Very low success rate. It's pretty hard to scan through all the uh, applications coming in and try and make an uh, assumption and judgment. It, it takes time, but the success rate is pretty slow. And the last and final point, outsource and automate whatever that you can, right? There will be so many mundane tasks that you will have to build or have built during the early phase. If you can automate that early and sooner, you know, you will reap the benefits later on. All right, so let's talk a little bit about people and culture. Uh, and what you see on the right, these are DO values, right? They are printed on our second floor headquarters on a big screen. These are the values the company lives by, right? And, and, you know, and people ask me about what is culture? Is it your value, right? The answer is your values are not your culture. Values essentially allow you to set a culture, your virtue, is your culture, right? Culture is something uh, that people are behaving when you're not watching them. The decisions and the assumptions they are making when you're not around, right? That is what defines your culture, how your employees and individual in the company is behaving when, when somebody's not watching. Value runs as a good guiding point, a principle on building a culture, right? So it is critical to get the values right, and it is super critical to get and t invest time in defining uh, the culture right, right? 
because you know most of the time employees want to come and work for a company, uh, not just for a salary, not to try and just solve a uh, core mission, but they value the culture. Can I relate myself to this company and the mission that they're trying to solve, right? So take a time to invest in a culture because that is super, super important, right? And it also helps you identify the anti-pattern, right? There's always this one person that's not the right fit in the culture. Be aware of that. Make that as a part of your hiring process. If you end up hiring that person inside the company, that can destroy the culture, right? If you identify, don't wait too long. Make it easy for that person, make it easy for yourself, right? So that's super, super critical to get that right. Now, how do you organize your team? You know, it defines you know, how you're gonna execute and whatnot. These are the topics as you start getting bigger and bigger, there will uh, be some organizational issues that you'll see here and then, but organizing your team, uh, not from engineering and a product and a different vertical perspective is a super key to the direction that you wanna take as a company, right? Because there will be some decision making that will happen in pockets. You wanna make sure those decisions are not going in a different direction. Like, you know, Yancy, our CEO, likes to say, you know, when things are going in, arrows are going in a different direction, you're probably doing something wrong. They all should be going in the right direction. And they will go in the right direction when you are organized correctly, right? So it's, it's critical to get that right. Be careful on what you measure because that drives people's behavior, right? And I'll give you an example of Microsoft. And I started my career as a support engineer, right? Taking customers' calls, talking to them every single day. Uh, supporting IIS or whatnot. And those metrics around, you know, how do we measure success will change. So one of the metrics was like, you know, we need to deliver solution to the customer as soon as possible, first contact, right? Great. How do you deliver solution first contact? Is when you s get a support case, you see the issue, you reply and response back, and there's a field that you say, solution delivered. And that was the metric that people were measuring. You know what people started doing? They got the issue. They haven't even talked to a customer. They know what is the issue. They write an email out, oh, here's the issue, this is what I'm gonna fix your issue. They'll go change the field. Great, you know, solution deliver, first contact, everybody's celebrating high five numbers and 90% or whatnot. Guess what's happening? Those guys are still talking to customers for over one month, going back and forth over email and on the phone, the solution's not delivered, right? So be careful on what you measure because that will drive the behavior. And not just in support, even in writing, code and how you measure the code quality, the bugs and whatnot. So that is also critical to define, you know, what you're gonna be measuring. And again, analyze, accept, and make the trade-off decisions, right? You know, you'll, you'll reach a point where uh, in your product building exercises, there will be some features and decisions that you'll have to make. Well, I'm not gonna do this this quarter. And here's why, right? I'm not gonna solve for this problem for foreseeable future. And here's why. You have to understand you cannot solve everything at any given time and distribute a team saying, you know what, let's just solve all these five things. I'll give you one person, you, got, you work on this, you work on that. No, no, it doesn't work that way, right? Be very clear on what you wanna solve and when. And that is super critical, right? Don't fall into this trap of, you know, I have these five customers asking 10 different things, let me try and solve them all in one quarter. Bad, bad idea. <laughs> yeah, there you go, <laughs> right? So somebody, somebody can relate to that, right? <laughs> You know, I, I, yeah. Usually, usually send him like five things you need to do for a day. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. See, one, one final point that I'll make about culture, because, you know, again, this is a very critical topic, right? You know, you might, might have heard this term, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, which is true, right? They go hand to hand, right? But I'll also tell you one thing. If you do not have a good product, and if you have a very, very dangerous competitor, culture will do nothing. Right, and you need to be mindful for that. And I'll give you, I'll give you a few examples in a way. Like, you know, think, look, look at the athletes, right? Uh, if you're an athlete, if you're a good, good football player, right, you know, we're, we're in Lisbon, in Portugal, let's talk about Cristiano Ronaldo, right? Ronaldo, he's gifted, right? He's a great player. For him, the culture is essentially having the right nutrition, having the right regime to work out and whatnot but he has the skills to go with. That's the product to go with for him to be successful, right? You cannot just take a random person and myself and say, you know what, I'm gonna have a great nutrition, I'm gonna work out and I'm gonna be Ronaldo. Yeah, it's not gonna work, man. You see what I'm saying? But if you have a person, he might suck a little bit on nutrition or whatnot, but he'll still do better. Nutrition will help, right? So culture will help 
make better products. But if you don't have the products and if you are in Western culture, you're not going anywhere, right? Trust me on that, right? So focus on building the right products too. All right. Again, we'll, we'll keep this short, like, you know, with the process, the process is one of the bad words in a way, like, you know, see no bad, you know, hear no bad, you know, talk no bad, but at the end of the day, it's the reality. Everybody has to accept, right? And when I talk about processes, I'm not talking about really gigantic processes that make people go through a bunch of hoops and whatnot. Smaller, simple things, like, you know, should I be getting a code review done when I'm making a check-in, when you start starting? Great idea. Should I do a code review in a critical path when I'm billing the customers twice from a cross-functional? Fantastic idea. Should I comment my code out? Great, right? Hey, I did this new cool thing. Only I know how to do it. Should I document that? Great idea. Because guess what? When your company grows, when you have to hire 50 people at start and really fast, and if you do not have a process, it will be a chaos, right? So invest in the processes that are common sense. Do not neglect. All right, so now we'll get into the fun stuff and I'll show, uh, share some of the stories as well. Uh, how many of you know about the S-curve of innovation? Right, right, right. So those who don't, uh, let me explain you a little bit what all that is, right? This is a pretty standard way of building product, right? This is somewhere you're starting, you're trying to get an MVP. You don't know what's happening, it's all great, right? And the, and the S actually is not showing right way, but it starts this way, there's a deep curve. In the after shipping MVP, you know, the product's probably not getting traction. You're like, oh boy, you know, <laughs> am I building something right, you know? And then all of a sudden, it starts going up. And you go, like, aha, yeah, I'm getting some traction, you know, things are looking good. Maybe I wasn't wrong, right? And then all of a sudden, you reach this point, you go like, man, this is looking good. Like, you know, let's see where, where it is, right? And then you start going, it's going here. Like, hell yeah, we're going to be all rich. You know, everybody buys Ferrari, you know, the life is great. You know, we made it, right? And then all of a sudden, you're going to hit this plateau and you go like, oh my God, what just happened? Like, what do I do? That is the innovative dilemma, right? What I'm talking about from the S curve is this, even before you reach this point, having the insight to start the next wave of innovation. What is that next product? Somewhere here, when you are partying and about to say, you know, we made it, is the key. In hindsight, this makes sense, right? But when you're building the product, this is the hardest thing to identify. This is the hardest thing to understand. So the key takeaway there is to, when things are going great, question yourself. <laughs> is it really great? How long is it gonna be great for? Am I prepared for that, right? If you're ahead of that curve, and I'll show you some examples on how, what my learnings were, you'll be fine. But if you're not, things will look ugly, right? So the example that I'm gonna talk about is Azure App Service, right? Again, I was, I was part of the incubation arm, so and I'll talk about not so dark part of Microsoft, which worked like a startup, right? Uh, we started a team with uh, four engineers, and the problem that we were trying to solve was reimagining Pass the platform as a solution, right? When Microsoft launched cloud, they screwed up, right? I mean, they had this cloud service and, and, and the whole way of deploying new model and web application and whatnot. We're not getting any traction, right? So they, the, the project, new project came to incubation. The task was to just reimagine the past, right? How can you make it simple for customers to run a web application? And at that time, the focus when we started was essentially just the web hosting perspective, right? And, 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 and following that S-curve cycle today, the service supports the web apps, mobile apps, function apps, API apps, and things like that. And I'll, I'll walk you through why that was easy to build afterwards. So if you go back to the S-curve, right, the wave one that we had was essentially build a .NET CMS-based you know, hosting solution. What does it mean? WordPress. What did Microsoft have? Windows. Great. Figure out how to run WordPress and Windows. Figure out how you're going to get MySQL. Just try and get those customers, you know, build a toy, right? That was great. We built a toy. People liked it. This is eight years ago. There was no Kubernetes, whatnot. It was going great, right? And, and then we, we, are, we were in this S-curve. Everything wor worked pretty well up until we hit the plateau. The way of second that we totally missed Guess what? The world has changed around you. You're living in a bubble, like every other product that we built. The world's talking about containers. Nobody wants to live Windows. Things are about Linux, right? By the way, now that you toy that you build about WordPress, 
Who's your big customer? Enterprise. That makes you money. He's coming in saying, I'm not hosting WordPress. I need this. I need VPC. I need security. I need compliance, right? All of a sudden, none of that made sense. Reliability. Like, you built a toy. It was so simple to get it up and running on Windows. Like, who wants to run PHP or Node on Windows, right? You know, really? Things sucked. So, that was the second part of the S curve, right? And the third, when we get, got to, uh, to fixing the wave to Azure function, it was pretty simple to build. But I'll tell you, the transition from wave one to wave two matters. The longer that you take, it essentially defines the existence or non-existence for your product and the company, right? Some of the technical decisions that you made, the tech that, that you made, is it making it easy for you to ride the wave two? And were you catching the wave two at the right time or were you waiting for the plateau to happen, right? In some cases, there were multiple S-curves within the transition, right? Where we picked some of the waves, we knew this is not gonna be flying too long, which was the enterprise scale, because you know we had the knowledge. We knew that customers gonna come in, they're gonna need enterprise, so that was pretty easy to find that curve. Like right when we were celebrating, we made it, right? There was an arm that spun out, they said, well, let's just go do enterprise. Reliability was simple, right? When we shipped it, you know, customers are complaining, site's not up and running, you don't like it, you go fix it. Easy S-curves. The one that we missed big time is container and Linux, right? All of a sudden, you wake up in the morning, voila, there is Kubernetes, right? You build the custom orchestration that just acted like Kubernetes, is running on Windows, people want to run containers, people want to run Linux, you have a new boss, Satya, who wants Linux, right? All of a sudden, this transition, was the most disastrous transition ever, right? Because everything that you built on top of Windows, now try and replicate that on Linux, right? The decisions that you had to make, rebuild the whole thing on this new thing, Kubernetes, take about four years, five years to launch the product, we'll figure out the strategy. No, this is where taking the building on a technical debt played a big role. We did some of the craziest things possible from booting a Windows VM into Linux on the fly trying to change all the VMs, images, about 1,200 of them in a one single stamp in a multiple ways, right? Uh, in, a, in a multiple ways, it, it was uh, hard. But you know, that tech that, that was taken, that helped make the transition, and once that was all built, the building the serverless and Azure function and whatnot was super, super easy. Another great example, you know, again, I've, I've not been with the DO, but this is a study that I did, as, uh, like, a lot, a lot, right? You know, let's take DigitalOcean for an example, right? We built the product Jan January, you know, 2012. Simple product with a single database, single data center, spinning a droplet, piece of cake, right? All the information about customers in a single database. Life's great, right? The founders did a great job. They somehow were, uh, uh, from, from this point to here somewhere, they got into Techstar. And they launched SSD-based droplets. That was the moment, right? People feel great about it, and you see, aha, you know, this, we're up to something, it's, it's doing great. So instead of, you know, uh, shipping about, uh, spinning about less than 100 droplets a day, you know, you, the numbers are starting to look great. Fantastic. This is where the press started picking up. Here is this new company that's taking on AWS, right? And, and it's building these price to performance, $5 SSD droplets. World is gonna change, that's amazing. All these spikes that you see, they were all press releases. What you don't see from here on out is actually 100x, 200x investment on, on, on the growth. Now, if you take the analogy back, right? When we built the product, single database, single data center, life made sense. All of a sudden, the product took off. Now you got a single database, not one data center, probably four, five. Now all of them are trying to talk to a single database, and yeah, you know, you had a problem. You had to reset, understand. But if you ask me a question, did it work out well for you? Yeah, we're all here talking about the company and the great things we're gonna fix. So yeah, that was a fantastic example of riding the S wave, taking the right bets, right? And knowing what technology decisions that you have to make and fix them. All right, so to summarize, like, you know, the scaling up your startup is, you know, different challenges for different companies. You're gonna see these uh, issues coming in at different times. They will evolve, just keep a track of what you, solving for what you're not solving for, and in the long run, you know, those things will help. One last thing that I wanna leave on is that last example, again, going back to culture, uh, you know, setting up the culture at the get-go is super easy, but you will find times in your company life cycle 
where you're going to have to reset the culture when you're growing at a really, really high scale. You know what? This is fill in the bank situation to be in. And the word is not awesome, <laughs> it's not amazing. It starts with S, ends with T, right? There are some really, really critical decision making that you have to do when you go through that chance. And there is no way, let me tell you guys, now there is no way to avoid that. You are going to see that. It is bound to happen. How you go and approach that is going to be the key, right? And one of the biggest things that you do there, you make a decision that highlights the priorities, right? You walk the talk, and I'll, I'll, and I'll, make, I'll help you make a sense from the example on how we solve that, right? Second thing, you need to start over, right? And in other things, you have to do, define a new values and create a shocking rule. And I'll tell you what I mean by shocking rule. Right? And you start over, you identify a breakdown, you go back to you know, what made you successful, repeat the cycle, try and hire an insider if you can. If not, if you want to ch change culture, get somebody from outside, a leader who has a different culture that can help you fix it, right? And, and, and things along those lines. So let me jump to the, the, the example real quick. Like Azure's growing really, really fast. All the customers are coming in. The support that they build, was based on on-premise on product, right? The support wouldn't scale. It was a complete disaster. That culture had to change. You had to take care of the growth that is happening, right? So when we talk about creating new rules, uh, values, and creating shocking rule, one of the biggest rules that I created when this problem was on my hands, saying every single developer and a PM, when they're coming to job, they're going to review a support case, three of them, every single day. Every two weeks, they're going to sit with support and listen to those calls and find, give me the finding back, right? Was it a shocking? Yeah, every dev came, asked, why are we doing this? Did they ask one day, two day? No, every single day, and that was okay. That's when you know this is working, right? And that's what I mean by creating a shocking rules, right? People have a different approaches around that, like Marisa Meyer at Yahoo when she took over, like she went through all the VPN logs, right? And see, people are not really working from home. You know what the rule is? Everybody has to come to work, and that's a shocking change in a way, right? You make a decision that highlights priority, right? So when I was driving this project to uh, drive some improvements, there are big product managers and directors in the room saying, you, you're out of your mind, right? We, we gotta ship this product next week. We have to keep on building these things, right? I listened to them once. I listened to them twice. And third time they said, you know, well, from next meeting, I don't want you guys in this meeting, right? These are great friends. They made big businesses, but you're not helping me to solve the problem, right? And you have to take those directions. And at some point, these things will help you out, right? At that point, this is the hardest thing to do, and hopefully some of the learnings that I have, you know, will be and are useful to you guys, right? I guess we're over time. This is where I'm gonna stop, and uh, thank you again. Hopefully you found something useful.